Have you ever heard of the night hag? There's this legend that exists just about, well, in just about every culture around the world, of this strange witch-like creature that crawls up onto your chest as you're sleeping, breathing her hot breath into your face. And the crazy thing about this legend is that there's variations of it that happen all over the world. And like a lot of things that happen everywhere around the world, there is actually a fascinating biological reason for why this creature haunts the global nightmares. Well, what's this have to do with the conversation and this like epically long video that you're about to get into? So recently, I put out this book called Dream, The Art and Science of Slumber, which is all about the strange world of dreams and dreaming and what dreams and consciousness have to do with each other. And I had this opportunity to speak with one of my favorite people in the world recently. Her name's Kate Cavanaugh, and she's this host of the Mind, Body, Soil podcast. And she is, well, she's not the night hag, but she is this really interesting woman who... Well, how do you say it? She's a professional butcher. She owns a farm in Vermont, has a butcher shop here in Colorado, and is just fascinated by just about everything. And this conversation first appeared on Kate's podcast, which you should totally check out, and there are links down there in the description. I'm gonna just play you a video from her Instagram feed so you can get an idea of what this woman is about. Yeah, that's her breathing into the lungs of a cow that she just recently slaughtered to demonstrate the lung capacity of a cow. This lady's amazing. And uh, we had this great conversation and I'm just gonna dump you right into it and, and you can see where we go. We're gonna start with the night hag and we're gonna end up in somewhere just so totally awesome. Because I've had the weirdest year of sleep of my life. Mm -hmm. I've had insomnia for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a resurgence of, I, I have sleep paralysis. Um, oh no. Which is, a, which is a fascinating, fascinating phenomenon. Um, totally. I have I have ideas and thoughts about sleep paralysis. I've never, I've only I had it too. like once or twice, um, but it sound, it's like terrifying. And it's like this weird thing where your body uh, you know, usually you're paralyzed when you you go to sleep. That's why, you know, because mm -hmm. when you're dreaming, you're acting out, your brain thinks it's the real world. Like your mm -hmm. brain thinks a dream is the real world. So it's like sending the signals to move your muscles. And then we have this other evolutionary program to be like, you really shouldn't do that, people. Like, and it paralyzes your body, even though your brain is doing that. And then it also like um, squenches off cortisol. So you can't, you physically cannot be stressed out in a dream, which is weird. That fascinated people. me. I didn't mm -hmm. know that until your book. Yeah. I mean, you can, there's other things that happen. There's other chemicals and, and things, but like you don't release cortisol. And then you're, when you, when you wake up that, that paralysis program was not like removed and then you're stuck and it's super anxiety reduce, uh, you know, inducing because you're usually not stuck in life. Like usually you don't have that paralysis nope. feeling. And then that makes you anxious. And then you yes. get this, like Very. sometimes, yeah. And the common thing was like the hag that sits on your chest. Like this is the old timey thing. Like, like they call it the night hag in like the mm -hmm. old timeies in like the 1700s. And it was the feeling of a person actually on you. Cause that's what your brain does. It's like, no, someone else is doing this to me. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's a paranoia that can come with it. Mm -hmm. Like a, a feeling that there is another entity in the room. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, just crippling anxiety that you are, I, I, my fear is always that I now have locked in syndrome, right? That I'm yeah. stuck forever, uh, yeah. within my own body, unable to move, but still conscious. And well, you like, had, you had it. You did have locked in syndrome. It was just mm -hmm. short, like mm -hmm. short locked in syndrome. And, and mm -hmm. since you have it, you, you probably know how to get out of it better than I do. But like my understanding is that if you just tell yourself, oh, I'm having sleep paralysis right now, it will go away soon. That helps. This is really funny because my sleep paralysis really only happens when I'm napping um, or oh, oh, when yeah. I okay. am dozing after being awake in the middle of the night, which is usually how insomnia shows up for me. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of happens in those, in those lighter spaces of sleep. Mm -hmm. And I often find that when I am in sleep paralysis, I am on what I would call the cusp of that hypnagogic space mm -hmm. that I am awake, but not quite like right. there is a little bit of an element of thick viscous, dreamy quality to everything. And I mm -hmm. find that getting out of that 
sort of experience of uh, the groggiest you've ever felt is really hard. And one of the things, few things I can regulate is my breathing. And often oh, okay. if I can mm -hmm. speed up my breathing, I can kind of begin to wake up my body. And uh. then I have to force myself into a sitting, like up and sitting or else I'll fall right back into yeah, that paralysis. Interesting. So actually, um, we're probably going to get into this. We've already just like, jumped into the podcast. We're like, all right, where are we going? <laughs> um, so hypnagogia uh, is the, and I pronounce that in like eight different ways. So I'll say it's like three different ways. Me in too. This I podcast. say hypnagogia. Yeah, me too. So what that is, is that's your first, like that's when you're falling asleep, but you're not quite asleep, but you're sort of asleep and you're having these like sort of free associations. I don't think you're getting sleep paralysis there. I think you actually went down at least one more level into like mm. stage two sleep and then woke up out of it. And you're like, you know, when you wake up from a nap and you feel like you're underwater, you're like, mm -hmm. things just don't work right. Oh, what's going on? That is, you were sort of in between that and the next stage where you actually get um, paralyzed. Mm -hmm. And like, that's the worst nap. Like the worst nap ends at that point because you're <laughs> like, how do you get out of it? Like, it's hard. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, that's, and that's exactly what it is. And I think, I mean, since we're here, I just want to dive right in because I think that one of the interesting things is to think about, and I always think about this whenever I'm in sleep paralysis is like, who, who, who am I in this space? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things mm -hmm. that I thought was really interesting that your book played with was this idea of consciousness mm -hmm. and this sort of idea that we think that who we are in sleep is different than who we are in our wakeful life and, and playing with both that idea and the idea of consciousness as a continuum, not an on off switch. Right. And I, I kind of wanted to start there because I thought that this was a really, I don't know, interesting place to play around in. Yeah, it's the most interesting part of the book of my journey. Like, it's why I didn't do a napping book. It's why I did a dream book because all of my, not all of my books, but most of my books have to do with consciousness in some way. They like, do. Yeah. Who are we? What does awareness mean? Um, how do I act in the world? What is my relationship with outside of my body? And dreams are sort of like what's going on inside the body and the. Mm -hmm. We can talk about this in a few different ways, but when we are dreaming, like in the normal waking world, when you sense what's going on outside your body, you know, your, 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 your flesh, your flesh sack, um, you, you get all of that information through your nerves, through your peripheral nervous system. And in order for mm -hmm. it to get into your brain, it has to literally travel. Like it has to travel and traveling takes time. Oh, yes. not Okay. Yeah. Not very yeah, much time but a little bit of time. Uh, in fact, it, like on average, it's like, depending on the length of the signal, it's about one fifth of a second. That's, that's how you're, that's how far the lag is. And from an evolutionary perspective, a fifth of a second doesn't matter all the time, but it does sometimes. Like mm -hmm. if someone was shooting an arrow or at you or, or throwing a spear at you, you don't want to be a fifth of a second behind in your reactions. Yeah. You want to be like on the spot, but you literally cannot detect your brain can't detect and react in that time. So what your brain does, and this is insane, mm -hmm. is, it, is it gets that information and it assembles the information from that world into experience, we can call it. This is the experience of consciousness, which is a simulation of the world because your brain isn't directly experiencing the world. It's experiencing the, the electrical and chemical signals and it's telling you what those signals mean. And so there's that like already what you experience in the world is a simulation and it's behind time. So then what your brain does, and this is all very well established neuroscience, like I'm not making mm -hmm. shit up, this is the way it goes. What your brain does is then it's, it makes a whole predictive model about the world and speeds it up one fifth of a second. So you're not only not experiencing the world, you're experiencing the world behind time and then you're experiencing the simulation of the world in advance. And that is how you and me are talking. Uh, that is how you do everything. It's like this weird simulation plus prediction. And sometimes it's wrong. Like sometimes it's wrong, yes. which, which leads me to this like stunning, stunning revelation, which is that throughout the day, when you're awake, you are actually dreaming. The simulation we live in is a dream because it's a projection. It's a simulation. So when you're dreaming in when at sleep, like when you're actually asleep and doing what we normally think of as dreaming, that is a more fidelitous uh, um, uh, simulation 
of consciousness than anything else. So I'm flipping everything on its head because it all happens in your dream. It doesn't need to speed it up, doesn't need to make predictions. It just comes from what's already there. This can lead me to like an existential crisis <laughs> if you go on to go down the hole. Now, I'm not saying like the world's a simulation like Elon Musk might make it, but there's a neurological simulation that we all live in. Have you read Andy Clark's The Experience Machine? No, this on your radar. Great. great title. Um, I I pulled this out because you have this 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 sort of tension that you put in the the book between perception and conception, mm -hmm. right? That we have we have these external stimuli, which which you've written about a lot, and mm -hmm. then we also have our projections, our our predictive mm -hmm. capabilities within the world. Um, and Andy Clark is a philosopher that kind of philosophizes about neuroscience, and I actually pulled out this little quote because I think that mm -hmm. this is a really salient thing to bring into the conversation. He says, since brains are never simply turned on from scratch, not even first thing in the morning when I awake, predictions and expectations are always in play, proactively structuring human experience every moment of every day. On this alternative account, the perceiving brain is never passively responding to the world. Instead, mm -hmm. it is actively trying to hallucinate the world, but checking mm -hmm. that hallucination against the evidence coming in via the senses. Mm -hmm. In other words, the brain is constantly painting a picture and the role of the sensory information is mostly to nudge the brush strokes when they fail to match up with the incoming evidence. That, that means that we awesome. Yeah. yeah I, wa I yeah. wanted, I should have quoted that in my book because it's really well <laughs> described. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, and he kind of goes on to say that this also means that the experiences that we have had within the world are going to form the way that we conceive of these conceptions of these mm -hmm. hallucinations that mm -hmm. we are projecting outwards to maybe make up for this one fifth of a second time, time yeah. travel experience that we're having. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's so, it, the, the thing that's so elegant about what that passage does is it says we're playing this hallucinatory prediction game, but we are playing it in a real world. Like we're playing it in an actual physical world that has actual physical contact, uh, like consequences. And the real world's not an invention, but our no. perception of it is. And, yes. and that is bananas. Like the technical word is bananas for that. And, uh, and, but what does that mean to be conscious? What does that mean to be human? What does that mean to like have emotions and, and predictive behavior? And all of that stuff is like what I'm like running through in this dream book. Like that's my entry point. And it, it also like interestingly answers one of the questions in my book, The Wedge, that was like missing for me. Like, you know, in The Wedge, I'm talking about the same stuff, like um, stimulation coming from the outside world. How you respond to that stimulation, is that a bad thing or a good thing? Like, is that ice water? going to kill me or is it going to make me healthy and uh, do I enjoy it? So that ability for you to say, okay, this is fun is like a sort of a superpower that humans have. But one of the things that I, I did not adequately explain in the wedge is where emotions come from in the first place. Uh, and like, because like, how can you be sad or angry or fearful of something if you don't even like have the ability to form the idea of sad or fearful or angry. Where does that emerge from? And this book allowed me to sort of fill in that gap and emotions come from dreams. Like they actually emerge from dreams. You can't have, like, you know, when you wake up and you have a, a bad night's sleep, you know how the next day you're sort of an asshole. Like you, you say mean things to your partner, uh, you, you, you snap on somebody on the phone and it's like, you feel like it's sort of out of character. And it's because you didn't sleep. It's because you didn't get emotional processing that that night before. And we can go all into what that's all about if you want to go that direction. I, to some degree, I think I want to leave some of that in the book. I think sure. it's interesting to to talk about this, though, because I think it it forms the foundation of who we are. And I was really interested. This is going to be a little silly. Let's see where you take this. But you mentioned the word gist six times in the book. Um, and I thought that this was... Oh, I sent you the PDF, didn't I? I'm like, yeah, what? Yeah, so I get to search, I get to search it. Uh, <laughs> um, and I love this. And you talk a lot about how, how the gist of our dreaming, and I have a quote here, is 
is emotion. You say as the brain cycles through whatever got collected in your bin of short-term memories from the day, a cognitive process kicks in to discard useless information and forge them into gists of memories that later turn into the basis for your emotions. Another way to say that is that as the brain churns through the grist of short-term memories, it spits out two byproducts, emotions and long-term memories. Mm -hmm. And I was really struck by how often you return to the word gist in such a short book, because I had recently (laughs) um, learned that there's sort of this relationship between the word gist and and yeast. The word yeast is based on gist, which the the Latin is to boil down. So to boil down to the essence. But yeast is also from gist. And what I find interesting about that is that yeast is sort of the boiling down of life, but also the place from which life proliferates. And Whoa, I think that deep. emotions- I Only a butcher would come up with it, A. <laughs> 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 but go uh, on. <laughs> I think that emotions are that thing, right? This is the yeah. very fundamental aspect of who we are. And mm-hmm. it is also the place from like the proliferative generative force of who we are. Yeah. All right. We're going to do this real quick. I have a Patreon page and I'd love you to sign up for it. I also have a Substack newsletter and you can click the links down below to get early access to my stuff, get get an insight into the, the strange things that go on in my brain. And you'll support this amazing channel so we can do more interviews like this and these other interviews, like the one I did with Willoughby Britton about how meditation can kill you. Though sometimes, usually not, but occasionally. Um, Please go check those out and consider supporting this channel. And thank you, thank you for being here. And now back to our interview. I like, we like to think of ourselves as like Vulcans. Like we like to think of ourselves, we are very logical in everything we do and we're smart and we can look at the data of the world and like computers figure it all out because we are super duper smart. Like we, we like, and we don't actually think of ourselves as Vulcans, but we like to think that our decisions are as logical as a Vulcans. And we love to think that. Right. But very the, rational. Very rational. Oh, I'm right because look at my facts. But like most of the time we take actions, not because we've thought it out. We've crunched the data. Um, we, we, we act because we feel we should do something. Should I cross the street or not? Should I, so I look right and I see a car and I don't say, well, rate times time equals, okay, and that's about 50 <laughs> meters. And then it, it will intersect with me at X point in the middle. So I will not go now. No, I'm like, I look at that I'm like, hmm, that scares me a little bit. I will wait. That is how we, that is like usually how we react where I go down the street and I see someone who I love and I'm like, oh, it's so good to see you. Or I see someone who I hate and I'm like, I don't like you at all. And I go across the street or whatever. And like, this is, it's all feelings and that feelings are actually based on data, but it's Mm -hmm. based on data that was processed by dreams because throughout the day, your short-term memory is collecting everything. Like I like to think of the brain as it's not an exact an, um, anagram um, connect. It's not exact metaphor. Analogy. But we'll go with a analogy. There we are. Analogy. It's not an exact analogy, but we're saying that the brain is sort of like a computer, and you have your RAM chip, so those short-term things. When you turn off your computer, it all vaporizes, and you have long-term memory, the data storage ones and zeros on the hard drive. In the day you work on RAM, just like a computer works on RAM. It's all short-term stuff. It comes in and it just sort of floods your senses and it's sort of there. And you connect, you actually collect more information than you can consciously connect, uh, collect or you, you access, but it's all sort of there. At night, your brain's like, I don't wanna fill up my hard drive. So I'm gonna discard all the crap, like um, you know, the quality of light, you know, maybe I, you know, someone asked me to take out the trash. I don't need to remember that when I'm 80. Right. I'm just going to discard all of this information, but then compress it into essentially like a zip file. Um, Hmm. uh, And then that stuff, that compression is an emotion. Like Mm -hmm. all of that stuff gets compressed into one little thing and then it's stored in like this, this very easy to read format. And it's like a feeling about things. And that is why we dream like that. Well, there's like a few things that happen in dream, but that's like one of the primary functions of dreaming. I think it's really interesting that you couched that in terms of computational efficiency. Mm-hmm. And and I'm going to tell you why. And it's what surprised me the most about your book was this exploration and 
flipping on its head of productivity and and productivity features a lot within the mm. context of the book and and the idea now i think is that we have this idea that all the conversations that we're having around sleep are around efficiency right we mm -hmm. have our little tracker devices mm -hmm. and we just want to make sleep as efficient as possible instead of maybe leaning into a different version of sleep that that you begin to define mm -hmm. in the book and even the language that we have around sleep is the language of economics and and mm -hmm. of efficiency mm -hmm. and maybe in many ways, the reasons that humans have been so efficient at, at sort of world girdling, as it were, for better or for worse, right, is <laughs> that we sleep less than our primate ancestors, making us mm -hmm. arguably a more efficient organism. Yeah. I mean, you, 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 what was the quote by, uh, I think it's Alan Rekshoffen, Rech um, the, the sleep scientist, one of the one of the early most important ones said that if sleep was not absolutely vital, then evolution made a horrible mistake. Like it's the biggest mistake evolution made because you're spending eight hours not doing stuff when life needs to do stuff like you need to go mate, you need to go hunt food, you need to do the things. So why are we spending eight hours not doing things? It had to be very, very important to our survival. Uh, and, but you know, that question of efficiency is really interesting because I think that sleep has also been hijacked by industrial, yes. you know, the, the industrial work method and light elected the invention of electric lighting. Um, you know, the, the, the nine to five work day, it all messes up with our sleep. It's not, we didn't evolve to be in a, you know, to clock in and clock out of a factory. Like that's something we hijacked. No. And, you know, it's funny, one of the things that's been happening to me lately is I'm usually reading like four or five books at once, whether mm -hmm. that's smart yeah, or not. Um, and it's interesting the way that they'll overlap, not on purpose, right? I don't mm -hmm. know that they're they're going to overlap, but I've been reading them. Um, I've been reading Saving Time by Jenny O'Dell. Have you seen this book? No. Cool. Um, I've been reading a lot about time this year. So I read Richard Muller's Now, which is uh, The Physics of Time. I read Ellen Lightman's Einstein's Dreams, which is sort of a oh, fictional yeah. uh -huh. account mm -hmm. of time. But Saving Time has been a really interesting peek at the rise of productivity mm -hmm. um, and the rise of efficiency and even the way that we began to codify time. Mm -hmm. And I thought that you touching on this was was really critical that that we have this space where electric lighting comes into the picture and all of the mm -hmm. sudden that creates this means by which we can create more work hours in mm -hmm. the day. And so mm -hmm. that people that are selling their time as labor can mm -hmm. then labor longer. Better, longer. Um, better more longer. efficiently yes. make more, more money like <laughs> mm -hmm. make more money for corporations get on more assembly mm -hmm. lines and you also touch on bell hooks and trisha hersey yep. looking at mm -hmm. the nap ministry mm -hmm. um and how plantations thought about labor time and what that did to black sleep mm -hmm. absolutely i mean uh, uh, trisha hersey's book is um uh, is it the Nap Manifesto? And I forget the exact title of it, right? Um, but it she founded the Nap Ministry, which is like, get around a nap and do it as an act of revolution against um, the, the what grind culture. That's how she calls it. And I think that's a really good mm -hmm. way to call it, is that we grind as Western Americans at, at labor that doesn't always serve our purposes. It serves someone. Yeah, that's why you're selling time. Like, I don't need to, if I was selling life insurance, Selling other people life insurance doesn't really let me survive in any real way other than um, I get money to do the things I need to do. But then you expand those work hours to take up as much as possible. Uh, and as a segue, I just want to say that COVID sucked. But the one thing that it did for us that was so remarkable is that so many people started working from home. And then they realized when they worked from home, they could get their stuff done in a reasonable amount of time. And then they could fuck right off and do whatever the else they wanted. They could take naps. They could take a walk around the block. And it mm -hmm. wasn't like this guilty, like I have to, like the time is what matters, not the efficiency. And I think a lot of people, not all people, of course, but a lot of people have been sort of breaking that bond. And I think the reason most people don't want to go back to the office right now is because they're like, forget that. I hate selling my time. It is inhuman. Yes. 
It is. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, it is in many ways inhuman and we, and we haven't been doing it really for all that long. And we used to have a lot mm-hmm. more time. I actually think agriculture breaks time uh, in, a, sure. in a really specific way that prior to this as hunter gatherers, we had a lot more mm-hmm. leisure time, a lot more time to mm-hmm. lean into naps and to perhaps into polyphasic sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, and these other modalities of sleep that as you talk about in the book, we might not even have ever experienced as modern yeah. humans. Or we look at something which is totally natural as something which is bad. For instance, waking up in the middle of the night, uh, you know, at midnight, like oftentimes I'll wake up but somewhere between midnight and 3 a.m. for a little bit and I'll look at the ceiling and I'll be like, gosh, why aren't I asleep? I need to be so productive tomorrow. And And we all hate that. We're like, oh man, I had terrible sleep last night. Whereas in our evolutionary past, um, or if you, not even that, if you just put a human in a, in a natural light cycle um, for, I think, three weeks, uh, mm-hmm. they become polyphasic, which means they wake up in the middle of the night and they have this sort of semi-conscious state where they're up there and they're thinking thoughts that are different than waking thoughts. You know, they're, they're like sort of more abstract, especially if you test them, they have these more abstract connections and they're thinking things that's more emotional, Mm. more spiritual. Uh, and, and that is normal human consciousness. Like that is bang standard normal. It's not really insomnia unless you think that you have to, the unnatural thing was the, I'm waking up at eight and I'm going to be at the office at nine. I'm going to leave at five or five thirty or six with overtime, right? That is the unnatural thing. It's not the waking up, which is why. And the other thing that humans do is around 3 PM, uh, something with cor- which corresponds with the melatonin dip, uh, around that time, about eight, eight to 10 hours after you wake up in the morning, you, your melatonin drops. Um, the other thing that's that happens there is like that's normal. It's normal to take a nap as a primate at three ish p.m. Uh, work doesn't like that. <laughs> not to take it, not to drink another coffee, another Red Bull, another Monster Energy drink, and to power <laughs> through it, and and to to sort of go into this. You called it a, a relentless culture, mm-hmm. um, uh, which mm-hmm. I which I really liked, and and that is my sleep pattern. I wake up. I wake up in the middle of the night. Um, yeah. Wouldn't it be amazing if you just woke up in the middle of the night instead of had the first thought, gosh, darn it, I'm not asleep. Gosh, God damn you, God's asleep, (laughs) right? Right. How do you what, know what I'm thinking? Right. What if instead, because we all think it, right? We all, because we're, we raised in this culture. What if instead we thought, oh, well, where are my thoughts going? Let's see what this is about, right? And then, because sometimes I'll, in that crunching night of anxiety, I will, sometimes you just like, your brain spins in like meaningless ways, but sometimes it spins in ways that are actually super useful and gives you like actionable Mm -hmm. things to do in the morning. And you feel anxious about it. Maybe your anxiety fueled it. Like I, you know, there's a lot of things to pick apart here, but sometimes I'll wake up in that middle of the night and I'll have the big idea. And then that big idea becomes useful when I'm writing in the morning, or, you know, if I was going to go hunt anacondas, and I found the perfect way to hunt an anaconda. <laughs> this is my hunter gatherer past. Um, mm-hmm. You know, anacondas. Anacondas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, They're yeah, yeah. Delicious. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, They're yeah, delicious. Yeah, yeah. Don't let them eat you. Yep. You eat the anaconda. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Go to Florida. I think you can. I think you can hunt pythons in Florida just willy nilly because they're taking over the Everglades. See, and there we have it. And see, what, <laughs> what a nice random thought we had, which means we're good dreamers. <laughs> I really liked this exploration and it actually helped me reframe my own middle of the night wake ups where Mm -hmm. I often become ruminative in a negative way. I get on the, I get on the worry wheel uh, and, and spin and run. But lately I've been exploring what it would mean to enjoy that time. And I tend to live in a, in a, I'm lucky enough to live in a pretty circadian aligned mm-hmm. uh, situation and to be able to do that. Um, I did want to bring up, I I, ha- I had to pull this out because I think it's really interesting that you explore second sleep and you mm-hmm. explore this as a time that has historically correlated with a lot of spiritual practice um, right. that a lot of, a lot of monks and priests and, and various times that this was a time to become more connected with God. And 
because I just can't help myself um, in this book, Saving Time, she talks about the creation of the clock, which is actually yeah. born out of the bells from mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. monasteries mm -hmm. um, and that they set these regular chunks of mm -hmm. hours um, that were initially calls to prayer, including that that eighth one in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. and that the bourgeois class adopted these as a really great way to demarcate a, a cleaner idea of labor. Yeah. And that this is where a lot of actual clock hours were born out of. And so I thought that there was a, a funny a little yeah. connection in there. Time and spirituality are like central to the human existence. What, you know, you know, the Mayan cycles, we have these seasonal cycles, the day cycles, mm -hmm. the, you know, why does, do all the ancient religions care about the equinox and the solstice and mm -hmm. all of these other things. So then the, the demarcations during the day became vital to prayer, right? We have um, in Islam, right? It's you pray five times a day, right? At different demarcated times. And that segmented your day. And it was, it was essentially a spiritual Thing, right. You know, I, I, I would assume, I, I, and who knows how religions really start? Like there's so many questions, right. But I assume like this is, it's because we're, you know, we're, we're giving praise to God. We're supplicating or we're taking a time to think about our relationship for why we're here. But then that becomes super convenient also to be like, well, you got your call to prayer. Yes. But then get back to work. Right. So you sort of invert it to become a tool of the society that controls us. And, mm -hmm. and if anything about dreams, like if you think about what a dream is, it's so random, you're correct, connecting all this random information and you're thinking very abstractly, like it is revolutionary. Like dreams were like mm -hmm. designed to be revolutionary because they're like, we're not doing the, the A to B focused mm -hmm. thought stuff. This is our time to be like insane. Like, like you hallucinate, you're, 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 yes. you're, you're being super abstract. And that is, that abstraction is vital to the human organism. Like it's there because of evolution. And as we progress as a society where we dream less because we dedicate mm -hmm. less time to sleep, we are becoming less human because we're not sleeping well in yes. part. There's a lot of other reasons too, but like, that's a big one. I wondered in this, I because we do bend time in dreams, and this becomes mm -hmm. and and this this space, this second sleep that you describe becomes a space for creativity. And because you set so much of the book kind of talking about some productivity and efficiency that led to some of our sleep deprivation, mm -hmm. I started to wonder if creativity was and dreaming, dreaming and creativity were the antidote to some of our efficiency and productivity that they feel to be antithetical to yeah. that. Well, and why do we have to, to be so, it. why do we have to be so productive? Like that's a, that's a great, just essential question that I think we have to grapple with as a society is like, what is the point of being productive? If it doesn't serve you. Like if it doesn't like, you know, obviously we need to eat, we need to meet our needs. Like there's, there's a level of productivity, which does have to happen as it has happened since the beginning of evolution. You found your mates, you hunted anacondas, right? You, you did those things, but, but it wasn't all about productivity. Like I have cats. Okay. I have two cats <laughs> and they, I think there's one right here. Yeah, there's one sleeping mm -hmm. right now, and it is doing just fine with its nap. And I'm assuming that the cats in the wild sleep a hell of a lot, too. That was super evolutionarily useful for them to get mm -hmm. there. Uh, and and as humans, when we when we when we think that productivity and the reason of being alive is doing things. So what do, what do I do? I write books. I make silly YouTube videos and podcasts and you butcher things and like like but. But and that stuff is meaningful to who we become because what we are is sort of is what we do. But it's also like how we ponder, how we ruminate, how we make sense of this. Like, why is making silly YouTube videos important? Like, it's not the YouTube video creation. It's what those mean. It's like you're listening to this podcast because it is meaningful to you. It's not just a distraction, I hope. I mean, actually, I don't know, listener. Maybe it's like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we won't make assumptions about you, listener. <laughs> right, <laughs> might be distracting yourself. That's okay. Right, yeah. Uh, but and then again, maybe distracting is good, you know. And you also mentioned that time, time in dreams, and I think we can look at that for just one second, please. Whereas in the day, 
time goes forward. Like it's, you know, one minute after, after another, or actually, you know, the way we experience time is not actually segmented like a clock. Like sometimes time feels like it moves faster and slower during the day. Like that, that is a physiological empirical reality. Um, but in dreams, dreams don't give a fuck about time. Nope. Like, it's like, here I am in my childhood bedroom and now I'm being chased by dinosaurs, which I never have met, right? But I mean, and now I'm in the future and now I'm fighting terrorists. Like mm -hmm. it is, it, it's like, it's, and, and, and it all happens in one seamless simulated hallucination that makes perfect sense to you. And you don't feel any different in that, in that, in that dream space. Like you feel like you're yourself in that entire thing, even though time is bending all around you, like the movie Inception. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And I think that this was sleep allows us to to time travel. I mean, mm -hmm. both literally, if you're if you're out there with some dinosaurs, but also within the space of and and you say this when we're awake, time seems to move forward in one direction, and the transitions between who we are from one moment to the next retain a measure of continuity. In dreams, it's entirely possible or even ordinary to perceive yourself in a different body with a smaller or taller frame, a different gender, or the ability to mm -hmm. fly. Well, at the same time, moving between different time frames, and mm -hmm. and so it is. It's 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 bending and changing our concept of time, and I think it is also laying down that emotional foundation that mm -hmm. also changes our perception of time throughout the day because mm -hmm. fear makes time slow down, mm -hmm. and and sometimes joy makes time slow down. Sometimes it makes it speed up, you know, and mm -hmm. so that also changes our time reference in our waking lives. Yeah, and like if you have like, you know, what anxiety makes things slow down, like if you have a traumatic event, that actual time period stays with you like a keyframe in a video editing for for years and years and years until you are able to process it, discard it, reduce it to a gist or discard it. Like it like we like to think that everything makes total perfect rational sense, but our reactions to the world, the way we actually experience being alive, it is bizarre if you actually start like segmenting like, what was happening here? Like, why is my mind flitting back to my dreams last night? Or why am I thinking about the last time I spoke with you on this podcast? Like, like that actually happened, what, a year or two ago? And, and yet we're, we're the brain Casting a thought to a different time is time traveling. It's yes. just not my body is time traveling, but that simulation, you know, I don't experience the world. I experience my simulation. So I can move my simulation around consciously. That's bizarre. It's bizarre. It's awesome. <laughs> One of the things that's actually come up a lot this year on the podcast, I was just reading um, Kat Bohannon's Eve. Have you picked this up? I feel like you'd mm -hmm. actually really no, but like you're, it. You better put a book list for me to look at because it's not you've you've given tons of great um, great suggestions. I'll give you a book list, and there's always a book list in show notes because that's that's what I like about this. Mm -hmm. Just a book recommendation podcast. Um, she kind of talks about how crucial the idea of story might be to the evolution of what mm. it means to be human. And I think mm -hmm. fundamentally story is our ability to, to look at different situations, you know, and, and Daniel Quinn also would argue that within hunting, this really happens that we're telling a story. As Daniel we track... Quinn, the guy who did Ishmael, is that who you're yeah, talking yeah, about? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. I'm yeah. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, I know. I, this is going to be weird, but I'm going to go there. Whatever, whatever. Um, in in the story of B, he talks about this idea that our ability to tell ourselves a story is part of what makes us human and that, that mm -hmm. the first stories may very well have been about hunting because what we're doing is we're looking at a set of tracks mm -hmm. and I... I hike every morning and with some light snow cover, I've been looking at a lot of tracks totally. and to think about what might have happened in the past, right? So I'm looking mm -hmm. at these little mouse tracks and watching it scurry and imagining what might have happened and telling myself this story that will then lead into my present where I have intersected with these tracks and mm -hmm. a predictive measure of where that mouse might be in the future. And mm -hmm. so I think our ability to to dream and to time travel and to have memory and emotions mm -hmm. is this actually bending of time in mm -hmm. a way that we don't always think of as that. Yeah. And, and yeah. Absolutely. It's funny you mentioned this. Um, I will talk about my own wildlife tracking experiences, which just happened this morning as well. Um, last night, my cat brought a mouse into the house. And Excellent. I love it when they do that. <laughs> 
And and I, we noticed it like looking under the refrigerator, like really intensely. And, you know, I went down there with a flashlight. I couldn't see the mouse. I was like, ah, she's probably inventing it. Like she didn't. There, she's acting like there's us, but there's no mouse there. And then, and, you know, my wife and I were both looking there and whatever it did. It, we, we went to bed this morning. We found a dead mouse on our carpet. Right. So we're like, oh, mm -hmm. yep, she was into it. And then this morning I was out taking out the trash or something and I saw the mouse tracks and I saw my cat's tracks in the snow. So the whole story has come together through signs of never seeing the live mouse, but knowing exactly what happened. But we do piece that information together, like seeing tracks in snow indicates historical past, but mm -hmm. it's meaningless unless you know what that means. Like if you see the owl's wing um, feathers in the snow and you see the blood on the snow, like, like you still, you're you're creating that story. And mm -hmm. I forget in story of B, it's been like 25 years since I've read that book, but um, there was, there were anthropologists who used, um, oh, I can't remember the name, but it's like homo narrativist. That's not the word, but like, it's the yes. idea like the storytelling human yes. is, is. Yeah, that, that we are, we are a storytelling human. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and Eve Cat Bohannon makes an argument that, language might have really first occurred around the concept of of a story and mm -hmm. and she tells this story of perhaps the first the first woman to tell a story and i think that we are very much story mm -hmm. creative and and you talk about this too that perhaps when we go to sleep we could tell ourselves a bit of a bedtime story oh yeah if you want to fall asleep here's a trick here's like i have a couple hacks in the book like a couple things you can do because everyone wants some tips and i found this one really cool it's, it's it's just close your eyes the first thing that comes into your mind whatever that might be uh, maybe it's you you're you're in a place like you're in a forest right and you think about the forest and you say well what happens next and then you see a rabbit and then you follow the rabbit and then the rabbit gets eaten by an anaconda, right? And then and then the anaconda <laughs> slithers away. And then you chase the anaconda and then you pet the anaconda. Like it doesn't really matter what happens, but you tell you, you you just add one event after another. And that can actually lead you into that free associative sleep that like, lets you fall asleep, or at least you just get a good yarn out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, because because you're letting your brain do the thing the brain wants to, and you can just lead it into that. I loved that because I'm constantly telling myself stories and and it was a way to have a little bit more agency and autonomy mm -hmm. over the I think sometimes I feel like I'm going along in the story that my brain is telling me and instead this this felt like you get to sort of begin to weave that yarn instead of just yeah. following your brain down a rabbit hole. Yeah, and it's natural and I don't know if it matters. Like I don't I don't really know if the content of dreams directly matters and this was one of the things that I was talking mm -hmm. about with a a neuroscientist at MIT named Adam Har Horwitz. And I was like, look, if, if, if you're the dream guy and he's like the dream guy right now, I was like, if you're dreaming, like why, and their dreams are important. Why can't you remember them? And he was like, why, why do you think we're supposed to remember them? <laughs> and I was like, Pfft. like, you're just, <laughs> <laughs> you're just supposed to experience them. Like they're, they're doing their like mm. forgetting thing and you're supposed to experience those things. And that's like the free mm. association that's going on in your brain as your brain makes new neural pathways. Like in, in the day you make focused neural pathways, I see anaconda, I must kill, I hit anaconda on head with with, I don't know, how do you hunt an anaconda? You probably know better than me. With, with a- I don't know. A thing, a thi I hit it, it with a thing. <laughs> yeah, we'll club it. Yeah, Bring you club, club the it. anaconda. Yeah, uh, I mean, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but it's a focused thought. Whereas the dream thought's like, there's the anaconda. Wait, no, is it a rabbit? Oh, mm -hmm. wait, who are those terrorists? I like elephants. Like, and, and it, it goes through these like random directions to tell the story. And, and all of those are emotional associations. They become emotional associations as well. And, and dreams don't need a direct path because they don't have a direct output. Whereas in the day you do have direct outputs. Um, dreams allow you to think outside the box. And most of the time it's probably useless, like to be efficient. Uh, but you know, what's the point of being efficient in the first place? Yeah, I, that was exactly what I was thinking as you were saying that, that you, you can just allow dreams to be what they are. They don't have to be this, this thing that mm -hmm. creates an output. They can just be this experience that, that perhaps mm -hmm. creates an emotion mm -hmm. that provides a foundation. And yeah. maybe even, and I, I kind of want to go back in time because you, you said something about 
anxiety and and these sort mm-hmm. of you know if you have PTSD and a memory that the dream space is also a space of healing. Right. Um, and you mm-hmm. got into this idea of uh, suggestibility, which which mm-hmm. I really loved. Um, and you talked about. It, I thought this was so great. In America, at least, we like our rugged individuals who buck any attempt at undue influence. Isn't it strange that every attitude towards stubbornness also correlates with worse healing outcomes? Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And within this context, you talked about some of the placebo and nocebo effects and and how dreams can be a space where our minds begin to heal and our, our bodies mm-hmm. heal too. Yeah. And with, with the placebo effect, what they find is that the people who get the best placebo responses, which is like your, you know, placebo effect gets this bad rap is like, oh, that's just placebo. But like in my mind, like if you, you healed, so the output was important, right? And so if you can have a better placebo effect, that seems good to me, whether or not it's quote unquote medicine or not. Like I, I don't care about medicine. I care about the outcomes and, and outputs and the people who have the stronger placebo responses are the, are people who are suggestible, who are easily, who are manipulatable, who are all of these things that we think of as weak, as like really bad traits. Like I don't want to be a person who's just a sap. I I'm the best skeptic in the world. Um, well, being the best skeptic in the world actually makes you unhealthy. And so how do we reckon with that? Like, how do you be, because I, I don't want to be taken advantage by charlatans, right? But I Absolutely. Also... I don't want to answer every email that says that they have my Netflix account password. Right. right. You don't want to be a sap. <laughs> On the other hand, like you can just, sort of, for some things, if you just let go and you're like, okay, we're going to see where this goes, that actually can make you, you know, it can do the, whatever your body needs to do to heal because you're not forcing an issue. and. Um, yeah. And so if you can teach yourself to be suggestible in the right contexts, right. And and that's the trick, right. That, and that's where I don't have the answer. What is the right context? And Scott will not tell you because he doesn't know either. Um, cause I've been taken advantage of by like charlatans as well, you know, over the years. Me so, too. so it, it does, it does happen, but don't be too hard and don't be too soft. You know, and, and that's the, it's the yin and yang of dreaming too. Like you have your fo- unfocused time for eight hours a day, you have your focused time for, for the, the rest of the time. And that's okay. Um, and the other thing, you know, and the, and I end the book with this really cool meditation called yoga nidra, which is sort of getting like popular in the, in the press these days. I think um, Huberman has the, oh, the non-sleep deep rest yoga nidra protocols have popularized yeah. that. Yeah. And, and, you know, actually I talked to Andrew uh, when I was doing this book, I was like, Hey, hook me up with your yoga Nidra sources. Cause like, um, I don't have, I like, I, I didn't have good ones. And so he hooked me up with, um, Kamini Desai, who's, he has a, a book called yoga Nidra, which sounds like on topic on brand. And so I talked with her and, and when I was reading the book, it's interesting. Like Her book is like mostly like, here's why you need to yoga nidra. Like, it's like, it's like all like the, the, why the, the, you need to do this because it makes you better in a number of ways. And it's like 300 pages of that. And then it's like, here's how to do it (laughs) Like (laughs) at the end, which is essentially listen to a playlist, um, that, and then follow their instructions. Like, it's not so different than hypnosis. And there are ways to do it yourself without the playlist, like it's because it's an ancient technique that happened even before records were invented. Um, uh, but it, it's a way of thinking about your body and sort of letting go and, and having calmness enter to your body and, and like allow yourself to heal or um, implant a suggestion that, that in your subconscious that then what may play out in the future. And the crazy thing for me is like I had set up this interview with her like two or three weeks beforehand. And I was on a Zoom call and I like the day before or two days before I got COVID, like I was like, you know, crummy COVID, not, you know, wonderful feelings. And I was like, but oh, okay, I'll do the interview anyway. And we did this and she's like, oh, you should do my yoga nidra and, and sleep. I, like with my yoga going and I'll do one specially for healing your body. And I was like, cool, we'll do that. And it actually was the turning point in my COVID. Like I wasn't going to die anyway. So I think I was going to survive no matter what. So let's, let's not like say this is like mana from heaven. But for me, after my 30 minute yoga nidra nap, I felt a ton better. And it coincided with that turning point in the illness, you know, going away. So there's my 
total anecdotal evidence for why this is cool. Mm -hmm. And I think it's cool for a lot of different reasons too. I, the first time I did yoga nidra, I didn't know what I was getting into. It was probably seven years ago, I, mm -hmm. and it, and it just it I, I fell into it and had never had that experience really mm -hmm. of having that body awareness and deep rest at the mm -hmm. same time of not being asleep but being asleep. It it felt like a, almost a, a positive an inverse to sleep paralysis yeah. uh, in a lot of ways to me. Yeah, it, it's it's re so anyone who's never done it before, just try it. Um, I have I have my yoga nidra in the book. There's a, a I wrote the script out, but like you can't read that as you're sleeping. So I also have like a YouTube video. I think it's at like scottcarney.com slash dreaming. I'm going to guess. We'll get, a, we'll get a link in there. Yeah, yeah. Go, go to there and like it's a free YouTube video and I took out the ads so you can go just sleep. Um. And I think I put an, an hour, like an hour or half an hour of silence at the end too. So it doesn't go right into the next video in your queue or whatever. <laughs> um, but the idea is, is that as it guides you through these sleep stages, like, you know, you're in hypnagogia, you know, you're sort of going, you, you, you feel like you're asleep. It feels familiar, right? Yoga Nidra feels familiar because you're in these like very deep wave sleep settings and yet you are also aware so it's unfamiliar and familiar at the same time and it it's cool like it's it it's, is cool yeah it's, <laughs> i mean <laughs> I, I it's it's hard to describe a, a a sensational state it's hard to describe experience but like you know it ain't gonna hurt you you know, I should have put a line in there, like, give me your credit card number. We'll see what that <laughs> works, right? But, but, but I didn't. Um, and as you go there, you're aware of things. And then you also, it, it's a, it instructs you to let go, let go into doing nothing. And, mm. and how do you describe doing nothing? And that was like, I wrestled with that for like a month. Like, how do I say to do something when I'm telling you not to do something? What is non-doing? And, and mm. in, in, the, in a sense, you just don't do it. Ooh, it's like Nike, just don't do it. It'll reverse swoosh. Um, and, and then things happen because even the act of choosing not to do something is an act of doing something. Oh, that's a, that's a tongue twister. That's a mind yeah. bender. Yeah. That's really interesting too, because I think that a lot of this book is creating an invitation or permission mm -hmm. to do a little bit less mm -hmm. and to allow your mind to drift a little bit more. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think we've talked about in the course of this interview, a lot of dreaming at night. Um, mm -hmm. but this was also a, a permission slip to daydream and to let yeah. your mind wander during the day. And as I, as I was reading it, one of my favorite things to observe, we live on a farm, um, is, are my goats when they chew their cud. Um, mm -hmm. and I find that animals, especially, uh, probably even your cats drift in and out of a certain presence that sometimes yeah. they feel very embodied and other times they feel adrift in a, a sea of nothingness. And, and when goats chew their cud mm. and are ruminating, uh, mm -hmm. right, so to speak, they sort of drift away into nothingness. They'll just kind of sit in the sun and there's something about them that goes away. And, and that has taught me a lot about allowing my own mind to, to drift away. And I think that this was also about reclaiming a space of daydreaming. I love that. I, and like, doesn't chewing your cud just sound amazing? Like, it sounds you could, so good. Uh, oh, so I have a question for you. This is completely unrelated to my book. Okay. <laughs> um, but as a butcher, you may, and, and a farm dweller, you may mm -hmm. actually be able to answer this for me. Cows have four stomachs, right? Four or three. Four chambers. I mean, it's not quite a literal, like, it's not like four separate stomachs. Mm -hmm. It's a four compartment stomach. Okay. So they got their compartments and they're, they're cud yep. chewers. Okay. Yes. I was really thinking about this like two weeks ago. I was like, how does that work? Like, okay, so I eat food. Do I choose the stomach I put it in? And then when I regurgitate it to chew it, how do I choose the next chamber? How does that work? So this is really interesting. And I've thought a lot about how that regurgitation of that bolus of, of biomass kind mm -hmm. of happens. And so what happens is, is all of it is moving through these four chambers. And as it moves through the four chambers, my favorite thing to do when I do um, slaughter demos is to open up the rumen and to really mm -hmm. look at it. The texture of the stomach changes. So, so it goes from some something that's studded to something that looks like a shag carpet to something that has a bunch of honeycomb mm -hmm. and, and the, 
food gets successively more liquid. Uh, and then it reaches the so small it's like a strainer, intestine. strainer, basically. It is kind of like a strainer. Yeah. So that last chamber is very mm. liquid. And so that first chamber, you're getting two things that are happening. They're bringing up that bolus of cud to, to reach you, to break down the biomass mechanically, while you also have this whole bacterial and enzymatic milieu in that chamber that is working to, to break it down chemically. Mm -hmm. Um and it's also turning that matter within that stomach. You know, there are these contractions and okay. like peristaltic actions. Does it come back down through the same hole? Like, is it like, are the chambers like attached, big chamber, next chamber, shag carpet chamber, and then like small intestine? Or does it come back and then choose, like choose your own adventure? <laughs> It goes, it, uh, it, it, <laughs> it gets, it's a linear journey. Um, okay. it's always going through the same, the same order, um, and being, okay. being moved through muscle movements. Um, oh, so it's like when it didn't finish digesting, it was like, oh, go back up there and for more chew processing. Yep. And then it goes back down. That makes so much sense. Thank you for, for clearing up my confusion yeah. on <laughs> what cud chewing is all about. <laughs> uh, it's fascinating. Uh, it's fascinating to watch them do it and to pull it like you can pull it out of out of their mouths um and and kind of look at how it's being broken down and and kind of what's in there or you know when you butcher stuff you'll find it in their teeth and and, and are they like totally because they're they're sort of like zenned out you can just go in there and take it out and they're like whatever I, my i spend so much time with my goats i think they think i'm an honorary goat and Got so you. they just kind of let me do stuff and I can get away with a lot more. I wouldn't do this to some random goat. I wouldn't find a goat <laughs> in a pasture and reach in their mouth, especially because their back teeth are very sharp. You can cut yourself and uh, right. it's, it's kind of a gnarly cut because um, of what's going on in there. So I, I don't recommend doing this at home, but I, I have done it. And you can smell too. You can actually smell the methane um, when they burp uh, because they'll, mm -hmm. as, as it moves up, there will be some li little gurgles and you can smell these little methane methane burps. Delightful. Yeah I, try, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I try not to smell the methane burps from my cats, but you can too, if you want. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I've learned a lot about, um, how, we got here because I've learned a lot from cud chewing about mm -hmm. how to drift into being this, how to be a daydreamer, um, how to do nothing as it were. Yeah, I love it. I, I mean, yeah, sorry. I, brain has gone down to the cud chewing, but we are here to talk about a book about dreaming. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, dreaming, cud chewing. I mean, I think that this is, you know, animal dreams. Do animals dream? It's all mm -hmm. kind of kind of related. Do animals daydream? Well, I like the, 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 the fact that when I think about evolution, um, we usually think about evolution in terms of um, morphology changing. Right. Like that in order to, to, to get to the environment, in order for the, the animal to survive to the fittest, something physically changed. Uh, and you can look at that in their skeletal history and in the fossil record. Mm -hmm. And I think that totally evolution happened. Like we can we can parse it out pretty well. But what we're not parsing out very well, because it doesn't fossilize our, our experiences. And mm -hmm. the, uh, but we undoubtedly things had experiences. Like I think we can take on an act of faith experiences happen. And so if experiences happened, they also evolved over time, mm -hmm. whether or not that, that the, the evolution occurred in, in um, brain structures, but there's also the phenomenological thing that occurs that's parallel to the body. Like, like, Animals learned language, like animals dreamed. Like, so are there, how do we fossilize a dream? How do we access a fossilized dream? All I know is that my cat does dream. She's right here. Yeah, I can hear her. Bring her oh, on. We, we love gosh. a pet visit. Okay. All right. Chew your cud, Portia. Chew your cud. <laughs> <laughs> Portia needs to learn how to check cud chew. She's a carnivore, so she doesn't get to chew cud. Oh, obligate carnivore mm -hmm. at that. Yeah. She's mm -hmm. like, yeah, can you, mm -hmm. you're, you're waking me up from my nap. <laughs> Let me out of the room. I'm going to go do something. Um, sorry. No, don't be because Portia we watch sorted. our, <laughs> we watch our animals dream, right? I mm -hmm. watch my, my dog Goldberry dream. And, and you talk about this some in the book too, those, mm -hmm. those twitches and, and are they dreams or are they just, uh, 
the yeah, and, experience and, and acting out of muscle twitches. And every time you you talk to a scientist, like a person who's like, well, I study this objectively, they mm -hmm. invariably come to the conclusion that that is just a muscle twitch. And I know this because I study muscle twitches and I tracked it through the brain. You know, I tracked the pathway that activated the motor cortex and the motor cortex was involved. So therefore that was a muscle twitch. And, and like, okay, cool. You're of course, like the, the methodology um, guaranteed that that was going to be your result because, uh, you know, this is the hard problem of neuroscience right, versus the, the easy problem of neuroscience. The, this is um, David Chalmers came up with this conception. The easy problem of neuroscience is the pathways which things occur. Like where does the nerve fire into the brain and how can we detect how a thought occurred? Like, here's the physical place of the thought. The, the hard problem of neuroscience is how that hardware becomes experience, becomes a thought. How can I point to love? How can I point to dream? How can I point to that? And that is the thing, like, even if you mapped out every thing in the, what they call the connectome, which is the, uh, the Ooh. total connectome of, of all the nerves, how they interact and you mapped it out and you figured it all out. How does that add up to an experience? Like, I can't map that out and like, look, I have the map, here was your dream. It's never going to happen because the hard problem is taking it to that next step to phenomenology. And, mm -hmm. and so, and the reason I'm talking about this is because we're talking about experiences through our evolutionary past. Animals dream. I dream. I experience emotions. Well, they didn't start with homo sapiens, right? They, oh. The um, emotions are way back. And how far back do they go? Well, we will never be able to answer that with objective measures because it's not like a insect wrote a love letter that is now fossilized and stored on a CD-ROM that then I can access mm -hmm. that will never occur. So instead we have to just assume through, I guess, looking at it. So cats have emotions. I know because they manipulate me. So, <laughs> so, so cats and us have a common ancestor at some point, right? It's probably like 65 million years ago ish around the dinosaur time, uh, maybe even a little bit before that. Uh, so, so if either emotions co-evolved at a later point or emotions start before that, that, that point. And my guess, my feeling is it goes like all the way back to whatever was first, um, mm -hmm. something that, that first thing, once it had the, it could make a decision about its environment. Yeah. Right. And I don't know when that happened. Right. But if, if an amoeba is wandering around and it's like, I want to eat this other bug instead of that bug, maybe it did that through emotions or something like it. Fascinating. And, and I don't know, like here's we're in super speculative area. No scientist could be like, well, Scott cracked the code. Um, Do you think chemicals enter this equation? If we're talking about prolactin, we're talking about oxytocin in, in the formation of emotions too, or, or are these two things separate. You know, one thing that you kind of tease at in this is, is, you know, the location of consciousness. If while we're dreaming, mm -hmm. our, our body is in this state of paralysis, then our consciousness is not indeed embodied. Um, yeah. which, you know, and, and right now we have this sort of race to like, could we contain yeah. consciousness, which I think is, I, I have my own opinions about. Um, I think chemicals form a language for consciousness. And I don't think they are the totality of it. Like if you, if I inject you with testosterone, right. Mm -hmm. And I'll big, big dose of testosterone. I can predictably say you're going to have some emotional changes, <laughs> right? Predictably that something's going to happen to you. Um, I don't know exactly what it's going to be. Maybe you're going to rage. Okay. Or maybe you're going to be super sexual or maybe, I don't know, something that's associated with, with testosterone. It will happen to you, but I can't say that it was the testosterone, like like I can go one direction, the testosterone will cause something, but it has to interact with all the stuff that's in you already, right? So it's more like a verb in the, the sentence of your body. And I know that um, different creatures have different um, chemicals that go through, it's different hormones, different stuff. And and I, I, I think that some of these chemicals are, I think dopamine's pretty common throughout most creatures and it's sort of the more chemical. And I know that that um, bacteria will respond to dopamine in various ways mm -hmm. and you drop dopamine. And, and I don't know if there's a dopamine feeling uh, that occurs, but 
maybe there is, maybe there's not, but I don't know how we scientifically test that. I don't know how, how uh, I can't even tell you how you feel on testosterone versus how I feel. Like I, we can describe it with words, but what is, how does a feeling actually get translated in a fidelitist way? Yes, absolutely. And I think that our language is incredibly limited when it comes to describing some of these feelings. You know, we have a, a fairly mm -hmm. small word box from which to choose from and to mm -hmm. assume that we are experiencing the same thing when we talk about love or empathy or rage or cats mm -hmm. even. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that one of the things I, I like about the book in particular is that it's tugging at the idea of the constellation of experience, both both coming in in terms of perception mm -hmm. and and being created within in terms of conception right. and being predicted outwards in terms mm -hmm. of time as interactions with other humans, with, with me, Kate, and you, Scott, you know, across yeah. a 3000 mile stretch and you listener, and all of this is coming together to create this complex mm -hmm. experience of our own consciousness, which we are never going to find in the fossil record. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, like, it's sort of like the way you describe it, we sort of need, need a flow chart. Here's the, the stimulus that goes through X, Y, and like, and it's so interconnected and weird. And like where I come down on consciousness um, and, and is probably alienated for people to hear at first is that I don't think we are conscious. I don't think Scott is conscious. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Kate is conscious. I think consciousness is a act that occurs and it is about the interaction between two things. So I am not conscious as a person. Yes. I enact consciousness mm -hmm. and, and, and we build consciousness by interacting and conscious ebbs and flows. And it's also about the interactions inside my body, but it's not a static thing. And some people, when I, when I talk about this, they'll, they'll, they'll write to me as like, Scott, you don't believe in a soul, right? You don't believe <laughs> that the body has a ghost in it that creates all activity. I'm like, well, you're right. I don't believe that. But I do believe that if this thing like a soul is out there, it's really we're all participating. It. It's something that's so much bigger than us. It is the, the super organism of life on earth. And, and that's embodied in me right now. And it's embodied in you right now. It's embodied in your listener and, and my cat and all of those things, the anaconda in my dreams. It's all embodied in all of these things. And, and we're, we participate in it. And we have this certain amount of time to participate in it. And when we die, and I did this video on my YouTube channel, um, you know, what happens when we die? And sort of, so I'm sort of hitting on, on some of these notes there. Your activity in life changes the environment around you. Everything's activity changes the environment around you. And those reverberations go out like ripples to infinity to some degree, like to, because one thing touches another, touches another, or at least to the whole planet. And if we go out really big, if we think about cause and effect, the chain of cause and effect, you can just keep going backwards all the way to the beginning of the formation of the universe. Like this is a Carl Sagan quote. Like if you want to build, make, bake an apple pie from scratch, first you have to invent the universe. That's <laughs> his quote, not mine. And, and at some point, the whole universe, everything in the observable universe, everything in the unobservable universe, the country of France, the, the moon of Europa, all of that stuff was at one point at an infinitely small singularity point that where matter didn't exist, energy maybe didn't exist. Like, I don't know what's in a singularity, but it was all there. And then it poofed out. And so everything in you was attached to everything else in the universe physically mm -hmm. at one point. Mm -hmm. And how we think about that, I don't know, but I think it's hard to think about that and not go spiritual to some degree. It is. And it, it tugs at something, you know, and I, I've thought a lot about this. This is going to sound a little bit funny, but we'll throw it around since we opened it up through the lens of, of food. Right. And I think that oftentimes mm -hmm. our, we can't experience con whatever consciousness or self is in a vacuum. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it is always in relationship to other within right. this world. And I, I think maybe that gets at some of what you're saying is that we exist mm -hmm. in relationship, in connectivity. And I've thought a lot about, you know, you have this singularity and everything comes, bursts forth from this little tiny point and it makes all the matter in the universe, which 
we then interact with in this sort of ever exchanging way through our metabolism, which I think is, mm -hmm. is the original Greek is to, to overthrow. Um, but it yeah. is this assimilation of nutrients that cross this boundary because mm -hmm. we really do think of ourself as this meat suit as it, as it were from my butcher perspective. Um, and, and we take in nutrients, they cross a one cell wall thick barrier and they become us. And so those things right. that were once other, that were once plant, that were once animal right. now become a part of Kate. But before they were plant or animal, they were rock and, and that rock mm -hmm. was stream and, and all of these other things throughout time that are just kind of reorganizing in this ever going exchange of energy. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the thing. It's a web of interactions. Mm -hmm. And we like to think that time is this point. Like we are a point in time. We're right here. And really we're the confluence of time. I'm the collection of things that happened in my past mm -hmm. and all of the interactions that led to that. And, and so what am I? I am, I am, I am everything. And I am nothing, right? All both at the same time. And we like to, it's so much easier for us to think of ourselves bounded at the, that, the barrier of our skin. Like I'm an atom somehow disconnected from my environment. But like you put me into the vacuum of space and I'm toast. Like I really need this, this planet to support me. And then everything that goes into supporting the planet, it's all um, connected, which I mean, to go back to dreaming for just one second, please. That's this why is why we're here. <laughs> this is why dreaming is the most fundamental unit of consciousness. Because during the waking life, I'm interacting with the outside world. In dreaming, I'm interacting with what I have collected mm. from the inside, from the outside world, and reduced to gist. So, like when you're dreaming, you are experiencing your experience of consciousness, which is you. Like that is what you have stored. That is you, the dream. Uh, which is why dreaming is so vitally important to who we are. And that's why it's more real than the outside world, but not in an Elon Musk way. Oh, wow. I love that. You, uh, that was that was perfectly said. That was incredible. And I think uh, what an interesting thing for this to be. I mean, it's almost kind of only the only recursive loop of 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 self that happens, um, yeah. though it is made out of all of our experiences of other, but it is the only sort of interior, completely self-contained world that is in your head that you have created. That simulation is, a, as far as I'm concerned, me or you. And it's during the day we add to it, right? We add, we, oh, here's some more information. We're going to grist that away. But you are who you dream. You are, and I actually, I think I have these stickers that I put out for my Kickstarter people. Like, and the, the quote is, you are what you dream. Mm. Uh, and the dreams are the, the, dreams are the unit of who we are. Oh, I love that. Dreams are the unit of who we are. And it's, it, it's it, funny because, you know, as a butcher, I like to say that you are what you eat, which is also true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but what would those things be without dreaming? Like, how could the cow have cowed if it didn't dream to get to be, to, to, and it's, pre-cows, it's evolutionary ancestors. Mm -hmm. Dreams helped that cow emerge mm -hmm. to whatever. Well, I don't know what cows dream, but like they had those cyclical cycles. We have that fossil record. All of those connections are there. And the phenomenological experience of cowing was important to that cow's life, was important to who that cow was. And maybe it makes it taste different. I don't know. Maybe a happy cow tastes better than a sad cow. I actually have no idea if that's true. Um, it is. Um, I mean, it, we could talk about different ways in which that is actually true, but mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it mostly has to do with uh, cortisol and adrenaline and, and mm. the way that it, it changes the flavor of muscles right prior to death. Um, you know, mm. that cow's experience throughout a lifetime, you get into a little bit of different territory, but I could make a couple of arguments. Um, yeah. Sure. Sorry. I mean, you know, that's the Kobe beach brand, Kobe beef brand. Like if you massage your cows, but, and I don't Feed think they do. Yeah. I don't think Kobe beef cows are massaged. I'm going to go on the record here. And I think that's not, I don't, I, I have gotten massages. They're 200 bucks a, a, a shot. There's no way they're putting that into cows. I don't think they're putting that into cows. I also think those cows aren't living, aren't living out a life that aligns with their biological urges to forage and eat in the same way. And I, I think oh, that yeah. changes, um, that changes flavor and, and 
it oh, might undoubtedly. indeed be happiness and we could call it phytochemical richness. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that if, if you're just being fed Snickers bars in a, in a small space, are you really happy? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, cow is such an interesting um, word because, you know, th there was a wild cow at one yes, point. Yeah, like, yeah. The and progenitor. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think the, there was is even a photograph of the last wild cow, like truly wild ancestor. I think it was in Spain. I'm good. Uh, these, my memories are a little, little hazy, but there was a word for it. Aurochs, um, I think. Aurochs. Yeah. There we are. There's your ancestor. And, and I think it, the last one died in like 1905, 1904, mm -hmm. somewhere in there. That was wild cow. The thing that we have is human cow, human yep. made. Our culture has changed that cow's dreams and everything else that goes into making that cow. And it is a different thing, just like a banana. Uh, and, and it also has a subjective reality. There's also the, the thing, and maybe that you could rewild the cow. I don't know. There probably are what re feral cows in the, in the planet. Um, Yes, but I think the question is, have we changed that cow beyond anything for it to go back in, in time? And I think that's kind of the question with humans too, right? Because I think mm -hmm. that we've domesticated ourselves in many ways. And I think that, you know, and, and to, to touch back into the book, I think that we have changed the way that humans dream in the last 150 mm -hmm. years anyway, maybe the last 10,000, right. 12,000 since the dawn of agriculture. I, Certainly in the last, since 19, what, 12, when Edison invented yeah. the electric light bulb, there's like demonstrable changes, right? Yes. And there was an epidemiological study that came out like three years before the tungsten bulb came out. And we had light bulbs before then, but they sucked. Then we got the tungsten bulb, which was like a, oh my God, it's so cheap. And you can put it and it burns bright and everyone can get, can afford one all of a sudden. And in the time pre-bulb to after bulb, um, humans slept one less one one less hour a day um all across the world within a few decades everyone had an electric light bulb and and that's thousands of hours of sleep missed per year uh that that well i guess not per year per year would be 365 but like over the lifetime it's thousands and thousands yeah. of, of hours that are missed that's dream time that's experiences that are yes. lost uh and those experiences have been with us since the beginning of you know, evolution, right? You know, yes. since the rotate, since the, like our sleep cycles are in relation to the rotation of our planet in relation to the sun. Like that is, our biology is literally linked to that. That's called chronobiology. Within a day um, and a year. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Both cycles in turn, like that's like the Mayan calendar, both are spinning uh, and there's like another greater cycle on top of it. Um, but that changed in like 1912 <laughs> and and we're now are now we are different. We are we are fundamentally different because of that. Um, we can go back to those, um, by that biology. Like they, we've proven scientifically, they took some humans and they put them in a cave and they 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 lit them according to the normal uh, light cycles. And you do revert. So we haven't like physiologically changed, but the change is, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, like you and I are not getting rid of our electric lights. Like, can you imagine how angry you would be if I forced, I forced you never to have a light bulb again? You'd be so pissed at me forever. I might be the wrong audience for this. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, in general, yes, I do think, I do think that that is unequivocally like it's it, it's absolutely the case, and I also think that you know so much of what things get boiled down to on this podcast is our our ability as humans to take a sine wave and create a line, or to create a to take mm -hmm. a circle and create a line, and so we create this very consistent flat environment, this consistent mm -hmm. you know ability to turn on the day at any given time, and I guess I yeah. guess this is a good question to ask because I think at 1912 we see this massive shift in 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 our biology and in how much we sleep though we also i'm also reading ed conway's material world and he talks about how much labor hours it takes to buy a light bulb versus a candle which is fascinating because he talks about copper as being really mm -hmm. integral to this process of electricity for sure um, for sure. And the way that things change. But do you think that with the, I mean, now you can't even sell incandescent bulbs. We're changing our lighting once again into mm -hmm. LED lights um, right. with even more exposure to blue light from not just our light bulbs, but right. also our devices. And do you think that right, that will take tungsten, us down again? 
the tungsten bulb was is fire essentially. Essentially, it's a heating up a thing. It's fire. Whereas like LEDs, that's like lasers. Mm -hmm. And 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 it's the, the yeah the that aspect of chronobiology is fascinating, which is why I buy my LED bulbs to simulate the the old tungsten bulbs. And Me too. yeah, I will say that whenever I go out into places where there's like a fluorescent bulb, I feel bad. Me too. Um, because that's not a natural color. Like mm -hmm. that's some weird stuff. And I didn't go an into any of this nope. in the book, um, but it, you know, I'll bet you people have. <laughs> they have, yeah. And <laughs> we, can, we can link to some of that. Um, <laughs> thank you. We, we, we've gone on a kind of rollicking adventure throughout the, the, the part of this podcast. And I think what I really want is for people to open up the book and to- yeah experience some of this for themselves because I think that you you put it so number one succinctly I mean this is mm -hmm. this is a deliciously short read um and I think it's a hundred and ten pages guys that's my selling point a hundred look how thin it is a hundred and ten <laughs> pages and you learn you get all this cool knowledge the audiobook is like three and a half hours it's and it's really fantastic funny. <laughs> I, we talked about this last time, but I love the way that you narrate all of your books. Um, that, that's oh, always how I, I've I've interacted with you is listening. Um, oh yeah, because I sent you the audio. I was book, thrilled. Right, right, I did. thrilled. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it never happened to me before, and I was thrilled. And so it's it's really fantastic, and it's well narrated, and and I think that. You know, I I don't know where you want to leave listeners, but I think one of the biggest things that I took away from this is getting back to doing nothing and to resting mm -hmm. and to dreaming. Well said, well said. Uh, and yeah, thanks. Go check out the book. I also have this YouTube channel where I talk about this random philosophical stuff. Yes. Uh, and it's, it's, it, I had this video that got really popular. I don't know if you noticed I had a video that hit like mm -hmm. 2 million views. I saw this. Like insane. I saw this. Um, and, and it's about split brain experiments. Like what happens when you split a human brain in two and then consciousness literally divides on either lobe of the brain and they have separate experiences. And what does that mean to everything? Uh, that was, that was fun. But like, I've got tons of more. You things. also have, and I feel like this year have really built on the podcast. And I know that that is cross-linked mm -hmm. through YouTube, but I, I, I don't do a lot of YouTube because I, I yeah. it, so it, more podcast format, but Scott Carney investigates. Um, yeah. And you've had some really fantastic and topical Thanks. investigations. I mean, I told you I really enjoyed your exploring the Bhagavad Gita uh, when Oppenheimer oh. came out to look at the origins of I Am Become Death. And um, I enjoyed your your last one um, talking about our, our techno solutions to, to climate, climate change. change. Right. Yeah. The podcast is really, it's, it's funny. You're, you're, it, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to do all of these different formats and like do them well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, it's, I'm putting more energy into YouTube right now because I don't know why I just am. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I'm trying, I feel like I'm juggling so many balls mm -hmm. at once mm -hmm. uh, and we'll see how, which balls I drop first. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if the podcast will continue, but right now there's like 30 or 40 episodes, mm -hmm. I think. And some of them are good. I think. They're really good. I really enjoy them. No, I, th I think it's, I think it's, I think it's all fantastic. I, and, and I love that you're out there and that you have a lot of different passions. I, I, this sounds funny, but I mean, just like from, from the vortex to this book is, is, is mm -hmm. a, a very different continuum. And I think you're chasing down a lot of creative pursuits. And I think in that perhaps, you know, I don't know how this book changed your sleep habits, but I think mm -hmm. that you really are leaning into creativity as the the antidote to efficiency, perhaps. Yeah, I'm totally inefficient. I sleep a lot. It's great. Life is awesome. You have cats. <laughs> I have cats. <laughs> you have they're, cats. They're... You're a cat person. Cat, <laughs> cat people like to sleep with their cats. Like, and it's, yeah, cats teach us oh about sleep. Yeah. Okay. So much to say. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you me. so this much. A blast. We'll always. have links to where to find you and to the book. And I'm just excited for everyone to read it. Thank you so much for coming back on, Scott.